This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com. This podcast was recorded using Zoom, so there may be parts where the audio is not as good as we would like. However, you'll be pleased to know all of the strong language is very much intact. Thanks for listening to Grilled, a podcast by The Staff Canteen. I'm Cara, editor of The Staff Canteen. And before I introduce my guest, just a quick reminder to please share our podcast with anyone you think would enjoy it. And if you can, take the time to rate and follow us. That would be amazing. So in this episode, I'm talking about Michelin stars, winning them, losing them, maintaining them, and the pressure the guide puts on chefs and restaurants to be in it and stay in it. Uh, My guest today uh, won his first star at the West House in 2004, is that correct? Yeah, Uh, which he maintained until the 2020 guide and he has agreed to talk about the highs and the lows of this accolade. Graham Garrett, welcome to Grilled. Hello. Before we get into the the contentious bit, (laughs) um, I want our listeners to find out a bit about you that they maybe they don't already know. Um, uh, Although as you know, you, you have done a book, so there's probably not much they don't know about you. Uh, if they uh, if they don't already uh, know that you were a drummer before, then I don't know where they've been. But um, then you got into cooking. You have a book called Sex and Drugs and Sausage Rolls, uh, where they can read all about that lifestyle if they want to. Um, and also you support West Ham, is that right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> Who, who mysteriously won 4 nil the other night against Wolves. I'm still in shock. Well, that leads me on to my first question uh, nicely, actually. So if you had a choice between getting that star back and West Ham winning the Premier League, which would you choose? Premier League. <laughs> of course. All day. Why would you not? It's never going to happen. <laughs> but yeah, of course I would. Because it's just, you know, like I say it's something that's... It's, it's the, probably the most impossible thing task out there, West Ham. <laughs> <When you're laughs> <losing. laughs> uh, so next question, who do you think would win in a fight? Richard Corrigan or uh, Nicola Dennis? That's a tough one. Uh, Richard. Richard probably. You're going Richard. You're putting yeah. your money on Richard. I would, yeah. Main, mainly because of the age difference. <laughs> <laughs> And then final question, as a chef, uh, which ingredient do you think is overrated? Quite a lot of them, to be honest. I don't know, we get trends, don't we? Hmm. People, people pick up on things and it becomes a big deal. And then you think, really, it's just an ingredient. It's all food. It's all good. Is there anything in particular? Um, no, because it's like I say, it's, it's whatever's on Instagram that month, isn't it, really? So whatever I say today will, <laughs> will be something else next month. Do you use? Do you follow the Instagram monthly trend? Uh, I try not to. I try to do the opposite. <laughs> I do stuff and I really like it. Then I see it all over Instagram and stuff, and I think, oh, I can't do that anymore now. Then because it's it's too trendy, so I try and stay away from it. But it's hard now because yeah. that's you know it's every it's all anybody sees. Everything you do is kind of Instagram based, isn't it? Or mm-hmm. in your face. It never used to be. You used to have to hunt for things. You know, you had to buy books, read, research. Now you just Google everything and. Mm-hmm social media is kind of taken over so everybody knows what everybody's doing everybody copies yeah you can't, it's not even copying sometimes i don't think you can you can't fail to be influenced by you know what you're seeing constantly so it's a natural thing you know so everybody does tend to do the the same thing at the same time it used to be a case of everyone went around looking at each other's menus after dark i won't name <laughs> Um, After dark, so, <laughs> so black market. <laughs> Over menu planning operation. <laughs> so in that case, then, do you think that um, Instagram or possibly some of the stuff on Instagram is overrated? Do you think you can be judged as a good chef just because you have a load of followers? Seems seems to be that way. Yeah, there's um, you know a lot of food looks amazing and people look and. I've heard it before. Everyone's like, oh, look, have you seen his food? So it's great. It's great. Look at this. And everyone talks. Then, you know, you can't taste it on Instagram, can you? So, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, that's still the most important thing. Does it yeah. taste? So we can all make pretty food, but, you know, it's, it's, got, to be, it's got to taste right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah it, does, um, it does lead to a bit of, um, you know, 
<laughs> Mis misguided stuff sometimes, but no, <laughs> oh, it's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, of course it is. You know, it's like everything. You know, the the internet has a lot of good and bad about it. So absolutely, it really, really does. I think as long as you're in control of it and only in small doses. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nominations for the Staff Canteen Awards 2020 are now open. Who in hospitality do you think is this year's one to watch? Know a chef who takes so many pictures of their dishes, it's cold before you can taste it? Get them nominated for Social Media Influencer. We have six categories all waiting to be won and the winners are chosen exclusively by you, our audience. Get nominating now. Go to www.thestaffcanteen.com forward slash TSC hyphen awards. Nominations close on October 25th. Let's talk um, about the West House as it is now in terms of the current situation. So how have you managed to adapt over the past kind of like six months? And last week, I know we had a chat before this and we spoke about the new curfew, which had just kind of had been announced and was coming into place. Um, so how have you um, got around that? So it's two questions, really, I suppose. How have you adapted? And then the new stuff, how have you then adapted again? OK, so um, we're, we're very small. So we, we had... 35 seats obviously you never do 35 because of you never get the perfect table configuration coming in there as much as you try to get a five or four or two it never works <laughs> but we had 10 tables um so we've we've now we've sort of decommissioned a table and we had to take lots of seats out so we went down to as kind of a 20 to 24 covers um which I thought was going to be difficult. And we're also uh, a day a week less than we were trading at as well to start. And we started gently like that. And I was complete, I was very nervous about it as well. And I was completely blown away at the fact that we were full and still are every service, every lunch, every dinner, and being out in the middle of nowhere where we are, you know, there's not really, there's no passing tree. You know, they don't get hundreds of people walking down Bidden High Street. I mean, it's called a high street, but it's, it's about, hundred meters long you know and it's <laughs> and uh, there's a pub us a corner shop and Chinese takeaway that's about it so it's not really like what you would call a you know a market town high street or anything it is a, a little village um, so there's no real passing trade so it's all very destination um, so to be full every lunch and every dinner throughout the week is kind of incredible yeah. and yeah, we opened the beginning of August and we've managed to sustain that and the spend has been incredible. Um, people are, um, I don't know, they're either, they're either so fed up of not having anything that they just want to have a good time and uh, go for it a bit or they've all got amazing grants and furloughs off the government <laughs> that they're to spend on booze. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. Um, long may it last. <laughs> But, you know, that was good because obviously coming from a place of the, you know, of lockdown thinking we probably won't survive or ever reopen, you know, and it's, um, it's a very difficult situation. So I was really pleased, obviously. And, um, and you just, I mean, my plan as always, I don't, you know, I'm not the most business planning kind of person, <laughs> but my plan was right. Okay, let's get through, try and get through the rest of the year sit down in January, see where we are financially, whatever, reevaluate and go from there. Um, and that's kind of still the plan. It was going okay. And then they, they do you another curveball, don't they, with this curfew, which, you know, I have to say is the most nonsensical, ridiculous, stupid fucking thing I've ever seen. I mean, it does nothing. It creates a problem. So there we were, you know, making sure people came in at different times, nice and staggered, nice space between them. No one had to wait in doorways. Everything was controlled. People were saying, oh, it felt very safe and normal, and they were confident. You know, we've obviously got all the sanitizers. I have to place biofogged every month. Um, so if you hear a funny noise in a minute, it's actually being done at the moment. Oh, is it? <laughs> so they do this and they do the bedroom. So we're doing everything for, for customer confidence more than anything. And we're trying to do everything we can to keep people safe. And um, and suddenly it's like, no, all, all come at once early and all leave at once. It's mad. You know, we've got people staying in the bedrooms. So, at ten, you know, you, you pay a load of money to come and stay somewhere. You think, we have a nice meal, we, we can drink. You know, we haven't got a drive home. We haven't got, 
and at 10 o'clock go to your room, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And, um, we started the, obviously we're trying to bring people in earlier. So we've, we've, we're now take, we're doing tables from six o'clock rather than seven to try and get it in that way. Um, People don't want to eat at children's tea time, do they? Plus, if they are back at work, they've got to, you know, they've got to get from maybe from London to here on a train. You know, they've got to get babysitters arranged. They've got to do all those things to come out and get it. To get here by six, I mean, that's a that's military operation, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Three o'clock yeah. in the afternoon, oh, we're off to the West House, you know. Yeah. It's stupid. And it I don't see any I don't see any gain from it, you know. We're not weather spoons in Newcastle Town Centre where you're they're running around after ten with their shirts off, are we? You know, we're in a, <laughs> in a stupid little, There's a know. time and a place for that behaviour. Yeah, yeah. Well actually I'd like to see more of that in Bidden and I Street. I think it would <laughs> As it was uh, said yesterday, and it is Scotland. Do you worry that that you know? Do you worry that that will filter through to England? Cool. I mean, firstly, Ni- Nicola Sturgeon should fuck off. That's that's the best you know thing I can come up with on that one. Yeah, I, we live. You know, this is the problem at the moment. You, you're trying to do what you can to get through, and it's you know, joking aside, it's it's kind of difficult. And there's probably you know, there's I know I speak to you know I speak to mates, everybody in London, everywhere else, and people are having a terrible time. And, um, and there's this real, you can't, you can't do anything because you're under this cloud, aren't you? You're under this cloud of uncertainty the whole time and worry of what's going to happen. Um, so every day now, you know, you're expecting another announcement. And is it going to be a sensible announcement that helps a situation, saves lives and saves businesses and the economy and all that? Or is it just another ridiculous knee-jerk reaction because the media put some story out or whatever else. I mean, you get to the point now, it's like who's, who's running the country, who's making the decisions, you know. I'm not, I'm not saying any other government or anything. I don't want to get political on it and say like anybody would do a better job. Yeah. Um, but it's very confusing, isn't it? You know, when there, there's, no, there's no clear path at the moment. It's not like we know what's going to happen. And you look at Spain and other countries, and you know, I talked to my mates out in Spain, I talked to friends out in South Africa and Cape Town and that was time. And you can see all these problems where things haven't worked or, or are working. And we just seem to, it's almost like we just go the same route, you know, it's like the curfew thing kind of destroyed the industry in South Africa. So, Oh, we'll do that now. Now they've lifted it. We'll start that one. I mean, it, it didn't work out there. Why is it going to work here? Yeah. The mask thing, you know, in Spain and Italy and places where they religiously, they wear the masks and have done from day one, they had proper lockdown. They'd done all these things. They'd done it, you know, really, really properly. And yet their rates, death rates, and you know, are really, really high. So you think, well, does that actually work then? All I see now is with this mask thing now, as I see people constantly taking masks on, putting them off, touching them, putting them in their pocket, putting them on, you know, putting them on a table, you know. Waiters are going to touch their masks on and off more, and then you know before touching plates and that. To me, it's it's more dangerous and spreads more disease. If you look at masks in the medical profession, where they're trained how to wear PPE and what to do, it they're covered in you know they're in plastic shields, they're covered in everything, gloves, masks. They they don't put them in their pocket when they go for a piss. They you know they get incinerated. They're not left hanging around. They don't keep one on one in the glove compartment of the car in case they pop into a shop and then chuck it back in the glove compartment when they've come out. I mean, it's mental. Yeah, it really yeah. is. As as a, a hospitality um, business owner, then do you feel like um, the industry has been kind of unfairly targeted and is being almost is penalised and with a kind of a, a blanket one shoe kind of fits all type um, yeah. scenario. Yeah, I do. Because, you know, I know it's it's like it's the same as the furlough schemes and things like that. It's, I know it's almost impossible to have a, you know, a, a different thing for every industry or for every person. You know, you can't go for everybody and look at their circumstances and do something different. But, you know, by the same token, this one thing, you know, this blanket covering thing doesn't work. You can't have one rule. They keep what annoys me is when when they do it on, on TV and, you know, and it's always pubs and restaurants, pubs and restaurants, which are totally different things. You know, you can't say pubs and restaurants. It's pubs or restaurants, you know, they're, they're different. But I suppose then you get into that argument of, well, you know, the, the so-called 
fine dining pubs or gastro pubs, but you know, they're not, they're restaurants. So treat them as such, you know, a pub's a pub and yeah. it's a very, it's a different scenario and I, it doesn't work. You can't, have, and we're, we're unfairly targeted, but you know, the entertainment industry, you know, a lot, a lot of my friends who are, you know, working musicians and stuff, they've had nothing, no help that, you know, they're, they're completely almost finished. And it's a, it's a real, real sort of horrible and quite sad situation. So I'd say, I'd say entertainment and hospitality, you know, at least we've had some financial help. You know, governments give us financial help. They've not given entertainment or anything. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a whole other ball game, isn't it? That, you yeah. know, they've not even been able to, re, like, reopen or anything, have they? So, yeah. No, no work. Musicians can't work. Anybody related to the industry can't work theatres, every, everything, you know, uh, friends of mine had all their, you know, all their work that they had lined up for this year, next year, world tours, whatever, all cancelled. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's mad. Basically all the fun stuff. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, when this goes out, it, it, it will be October and, and that would be the month that we should have been knee deep in Michelin speculation, everyone loves the gossip, don't they? So um, that is obviously different this year. They have uh, they've have pushed it back to January. Whether or not that event will go ahead in January, we will, you know, we will find that out closer to the time. Um, so th this time last year, you found out that you no longer had a star. Yeah. So how did that feel? And what was your initial reaction? Um, I knew it was coming. Um, not officially, obviously, but uh, I kind of had an inkling, gut feeling. Everybody around me was saying, no, no, you'll be all right. No, you'll be all right. But I was like, I didn't think so um, because of, you know, the inspections that we'd had. You get a feeling, you know. Let's face it, I'd, I'd had one consecutively, you know, 16 years consecutive. So you get a bit of a feel for, for what it is and what you're doing. And... Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I, I thought we had a bit of a problem, a bit of trouble. I'd have been very surprised if we'd have kept it. But you know, um, did they talk to you? No, nah, no, no, they don't do that. No, which I actually think, you know, I've had conversations with them, you know, during inspections in the past, and they always said things like, obviously, anybody that had one for a real length of time or anything like that, if there was anything slightly worrying or untoward, they they wouldn't tell them, but they'd kind of give them give them a nudge and kind of let them know that there was something wrong to address or something like that, you know, because they always say, you know, we don't take them away lightly. Um, we know it can be damaging to business and stuff. So, you know, it's, um, you know, they, they just wouldn't just take one off you kind of thing. Absolute bullshit because, you know, it's exactly what happened. Um, yeah. And no conversation, no contact before or since. Um, chef, chef friends uh, said, oh, have you rung them? Have you spoke to them? Have you done this? Well, why would I? They didn't contact me. Why, why am I going to ring them and say, oh, why'd you take the story? You know, it's like, oh, fuck off, you know. <laughs> really, <fuck laughs> off. So um, how did that, you know, you said you had the kind of inkling that it, it may happen when it was actually confirmed that it had happened. How does that feel? Because like you said, you've had it for 16 years. Yeah, so that, that, it didn't, I'll be honest. I mean, it didn't feel great. You know, it no. was like, very it's very depressing it's a bit of a blow um because you know it's um it's it's not exactly a great indictment of what you're doing is it you know yeah. it, um i worried you know i worry for the business i think is the first thing right is that going to affect me you know because if it affects the business then you've got problems um so yeah it wasn't great and it wasn't great for you know i just got a new team in as well at that point I say team, we're small, you know what I mean? A couple of boys, they're still a team. Yeah. Um, they just started and I thought, you know, they've come here because, they've probably come to work here because they want to work in a starred place and all that. So now you start thinking, is it going to affect that? Are they going to leave? Is it going to, you know, how are they going to feel? You know, so it's, um, it's, quite, it's quite a difficult one. Um, Were you angry, Graham? Yeah, yeah, I was at first, yeah, yeah. But um, but then you know, I get angry. <laughs> I get angry 
at everything very easily at the start. <laughs> uh, but it's my, my initial reaction to most things are anger. Then I, then I kind of think about it and calm down and sort it out. I try and, you know, when I was younger, I might have reacted instantly. Nowadays, I actually count to 100 or whatever it takes. Is that so, all it takes, 100? Yeah, uh, it's getting longer. <laughs> <laughs> used to, you know, it used to be ten of them. Think, fuck it, I'll be angry. But no, now <laughs> I, I try and, you know, I try and be a little bit sensible about stuff. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was, I was angry, disappointed. You know, all the, all the obvious, you know, feelings that you would expect. Um, but it also, I was out that night. Strangely enough, I was. Uh, um, I know they were talking about holding this big event there this year at the Roundhouse, weren't they? I was at the Roundhouse that night. When the when the Michelin thing was on uh, right. some private private gig thing party, and um, so I'd had a few. I'd been out all day, and uh, and uh, you know alcohol doesn't always help your uh, feelings and reactions to things. But um, it was a really really mental heavy night, and um, when I woke up the next day to the news, um, I had my phone. I mean, I had like texts from people and missed calls from. Some amazing chefs as well that you know I've always kind of you know the reason I cook and people I looked up to and that and I thought I've got messages and text messages and answer phone messages and that from these people I thought it's bizarre but oh the the one that was really strange was I had press you know local like Kent Press and all that stuff all trying to get hold of me for comments and that and I'm like piss off so I just turned my phone off right. so I didn't, I didn't answer my phone for a day. I didn't speak to anyone. And, um, and then when I did, um, I can name, I suppose I can name names. It's not a bit, you know, the, the Chris Galvins of the world, the David Everett Mathias's of the world and that, um, making a real effort to get hold of me and to talk to me and to say, I know how you feel this, that and the other. And the most reassuring thing was they said that, you know, we all know, we all know you, we know what you do. You don't become shit overnight. Yeah. So don't worry about it. And um, I kind of that that actually changed my thinking a little bit, and it and it did help, you know. And then and then the boys come into work in the kitchen, and I thought, oh, here we go. And um, like they come up, and basically one of them put his arm around me and said, "We just have to get it back then, you know, make yeah. us work harder." And I was like. I was thinking he was going to say, "I'm going to leave," and he's saying, "Now we're going to work harder." And I thought it's an amazing attitude, and um, and it's what you want. So that was the case, and yeah. that's still the case with them. Not so much with me, but with them, it definitely is. You know. Okay, because I was going to say, what's it like to you know have that conversation with the team about what you're going to do going forward from that? Um, well, let's like say they 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 were very keen to you know get their heads down and work towards getting it back. Um, my attitude, especially after giving it some thought, and now he's like, I can't be fucking asked. It's like, <laughs> I, had one for, I had one for 16 years. I'd never, I never asked for it. I never done anything to get it. It was never an ambition. And I've said all this before and people go, you know, but the, here's the truth, right? I had left London working for absolute head cases and all of that as it always was in them days i don't include richard by the way <laughs> <laughs> although we've established you think he's the best fighter so <laughs> you know you come away from basically you come away from all of that madness and people chasing stars and all of that sort of thing um into a little place in the country where I was completely on my own. I cooked on my own. I didn't know anyone around here or anything. I cooked on my own. Jackie, my missus, she was out front. She'd never done it before. I know this story has been said a hundred times, but you know, I basically said to her, give me a hand to get me open. Then I'll get you some help. She didn't know what to do. I had a service plan for Nico Park Lane. And I said, yeah, I'll read that. And it had things like, you know, polishing the glasses, doing this, you know, lining up, <laughs> up the cup and the mental stuff. And uh, of, of absolutely no relevance to what we were doing either. But I said, look, you know, all you've got to do, read that. I said, all you've got to do is just smile, be really nice to people when they come in. I said, anything in between that, just come and ask me. It won't be a problem. And uh, that's kind of how we muddled through. And, it, you know, we got a star straight away. And yeah. I thought, 
how, why, no idea. And that wasn't the plan. And how I, did it feel? Can you remember how it felt getting that star on a complete it, flip side to what we've just talked it, about? That's the thing. It felt great because I was, I was in shock. It was, it was, I came back from farmer's market. I was picking, I always remember I was picking curly cow into the sink. It was just before lunchtime and it came on the radio on the news that the uh, fat duck had been awarded three stars. And that was like the news story. And I remember saying to Jackie, oh, I wonder what's going on. I wonder who else has got them. I said, go up the shop then and see if there's anything in the news- get a newspaper or something. And she went up the shop and the phone rang. So I normally I wouldn't have answered it. It would have been, I answered the phone and it was Charles Campion. And he said to me, congratulations. And I said, for what? And he said, uh, West House gains a Michelin star. And I, and I laughed at him. And said, oh, just the one, Fine. you know. And, <laughs> and he said, you obviously need to see this in print. Stand by your fax machine, you know. Do you remember them, fax machine? So, we talk, do you know what? You're the second chef in a couple of weeks to mention the fact. I think it was Nathan Outlaw said that. He said he used to cover a fax machine. I went, there'll be chefs listening to this who are too young to know what a fax machine is. <laughs> it was stand by your fax. And he sent through the Michelin press release that he'd received. And we were the first one. And he said at the top, new stars, West House. And I was absolutely amazed. I mean, I, I, you know, I didn't even think we would figure in there in anything. It wasn't a plan. I knew we'd had an inspection um, because they, they announced itself afterwards because it was actually Rebecca Burr back in the day when she was just an inspector. Right. So, um, you know, it was her and we had a long chat and she was lovely and that was that. Um, I, I had no idea. Um, but then when it, it started to sink in a bit later and kind of when the phone started ringing and then I had people phoning up and congratulating us and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, and before I knew we were, you know, the booking suddenly went from, you know, me standing there picking a bit of cow in the sink on my own to fuck, we're full. <laughs> I need help. You know, and that was that was it. So it did. It made a massive difference. I, I've always said it tripled our business. I mean, that might be a slight, you know, exaggeration overall, but that's how it that's how it seemed. I mean, financially, it definitely did. Isn't and it amazing? Sorry to to see how it's changed from like you just said there that you didn't even know that you had a star yeah. to to the whole singing dancing <laughs> event that it yeah, is I'm, now. I was going to get onto this. <laughs> um, <laughs> We weren't allowed to even put it on the website that we had one. You weren't allowed to use it in advertising. Actually, I don't even think I had a website then, to be fair. There was. <laughs> it, well, no, I don't need one. Um, it was all, you know, that was all new. Um, I think I was just about starting to buy books off of Amazon. I think that's all they sold as well. That's, you know, I know it sounds mad. It was only, you know, 2004. It's not that long ago really but i mean no. it's very different <laughs> different world and um it made it made a massive difference to business and i say you weren't allowed to use it and then we had um bbc it was bbc news like six o'clock news i got a phone call from someone saying um i just seen i just seen your restaurant on the tv i said what are you on about he said yeah you're just on the news and you've got a st- something about you've got a Michelin star. So they'd come down and filmed and it was a Monday. We're closed. It's the winter because it was January. Then the guide came out, not October. And it's, it's, it's a Monday, cold Monday evening in January. And they're standing outside filming in the dark, the, the West house. And I'm like, it, it's, <laughs> they didn't even call and say, look, do you want to film? Or and then we had the, um, the local papers in. And I always remember the photographer coming in and saying, um, he kept hanging around for ages and ages to take a picture and do his bit. And he's like, hey, mate, I've got to get on with lunch. You know, what What else do you want? He went, I'm just waiting for for you to do the thing. I said, what? He went, get the award and that. I said, what award? He went, the star. He said, can you hold it up or something for the picture? I said, there ain't nothing. You know, you didn't get a plaque or a jacket or you got nothing. And then, the, the you know, it was, it was and, you, and then you weren't allowed to use it for advertising. It was almost like, what's the point? Yeah. But it, you know, it, it had an impact. And the very next year, when the when the guide came out again, I didn't know if I still had one. So I thought, how do I find out? Because you you didn't have Twitter and all of that stuff then. Uh, you know, there was so there was no social media telling you who had it. Um, there was nothing in any papers or anything at the time. So I was trying to find out if we still had a star. I went to W. H. Smith's in 
down the next village in Tenterton, had an argument with a guy in there because he said, no, nah, no, nah, the book's not out yet. I'm like, it is. I'm telling you, it is. He's, he wouldn't have it. I got on a train to London, went to Charing Cross, went to Foils, looked at the guidebook on the shelf, went, oh, yeah, we're still in it. And that's, <laughs> that was it. That's how I found out on our second year that we still had one. So when you compare that to now, we're going to have an all singing, all dancing event with the public around. We get people up on stage. We award you a jacket. Even if we award you a jacket with a new star, even if you've only just got some started a new job somewhere that's already got one and you've only been there a month and it's been shut all that time and you still get awarded a jacket. I mean, you know, whatever the circumstance is ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it's it, like you said, it's changed completely. I mean, I also get it because it's, it's their, you know, it's called promoting their brand. Otherwise, yeah. it's, it's like anyone, isn't it? They're, you know, so, and that brings me on to where I'm there. I look now and I think where I've not been involved, you know, with it, and over a year, I look at all the stuff and I think, well, my biggest fear was it, it really helped my business at the start. So I thought, is this going to have a detrimental effect? And I really thought it would have, but it didn't. It made absolutely no difference whatsoever. We we had the best year we ever had right up until the end of March when obviously things yeah. all went up for everybody. Uh, up until that point, we had a brilliant time. If you look at the 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 online reviews, and I I don't even look at them, but I mean they were they were all coming in great all the time. We had brilliant um, customer feedback is what I go on. Um, because you know then <laughs> instantly if something's right or wrong, if they like it or they don't. You know, customer feedback was amazing. Everything's been good. We've been busy. And I'm thinking, well, actually, am I bothered then? Do I want to get it back? My problem now is the boys in the kitchen, of course, that's what they that's what they want. And yeah. they're fine. You know, you know, they work hard and they, they love it because they now feel that they'd actually, they'll be, they feel like they're a real part of it. If, if they got it back now, they could say, we were actually involved. We won that back rather than we just went to work in a place that had one. So they feel personally, you know, part. it's a bit of a goal. Not so much for me. Had it been there, done it 16 years, long time. Now business is great. I always used to say, you know, chefs that used to say, oh, we're, 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 we're pushing for a star. I said, what does that mean? You know, pushing for a star. Most annoying comment ever. You know about pushing to do the best you can do in your restaurant and pushing to keep in business. You know, it's great if you work for somewhere else and you can just chuck truffles, caviar, finger limes, and that at every dish, um, and don't have to worry about making GPs and budgets. You know, I have to worry about paying the bills, and the only way I pay the bills is by keeping the restaurant full. And the only way you keep the restaurant full is by keeping your customers happy. That's all that matters. And um, and I think as well as you get older, food wise, it's like um, it's like Richard Richard Corrigan always used to say, you know, you know, as you, as you get older, he said you want your food simpler and your wine better. And I think actually he's got a point, you know, he's, yeah, got, a point. he's got a point. So it's all that said, then, do you think that um, I know you said that was your first kind of worry was it would affect your business losing the star, but do you think Michelin realised that? pressure that is on restaurants and chefs of, and, and the consequences I mean you said you you know your business is better than ever but that might not always be the case for someone that that relies heavily on being in in the guide do you think mission aware of the consequences well I think well they kind of they, they kind of say they do they kind of indicate that they're aware of all of those things which is why they say they wouldn't take them away lightly and they won't do this and that. but that doesn't seem to be the case and i'm not just talking about in, in in my you know scenario of what happened you know other people um other people that have lost them and done things and i mean even even with us last year you know when i was a you know, whatever awards thing or restaurant show and, that, and everyone saying, oh, you got your invite. And I was like, no. And everybody else has got theirs. And you think, oh dear, I ain't got. Um, so like I say, I kind of had a, an inkling that I wasn't going to get one anyway. Um, but right up until the, the day, you know, um, two, two restaurants that are not too far away from me. So two other Kent restaurants that have stars, so she's really not to work out. 
<laughs> I, like, I like what you did there. <laughs> there was only three of us that had one at the time. Um, so the other two, you know, were ringing me and saying, have you got your invoice? And that was it. I said, no, and I don't think I'm going to get one. But neither of them had one. So all of a sudden you start to think, oh, well, maybe then it's just a fuck up or or they're excluding Kent for some reason. And I know that one of those people um, was ringing them up and then his manager was emailing them and, you know, finding out what was going on or having that by invite, yeah? And I think he got kind of quite shirty responses right. back, um, almost saying, like, we, you know, all the invites are out, you're not getting one. And he had them really worried to the point that when I was sat in the pub opposite the roundhouse that night when it was when the live thing was happening, one of them was ringing me up saying, have you heard anything yet? Uh, you know, and like because Ben, who used to, you know, Ben, who used to work for me, he got his star that year. And that was the real shame because it would have been really nice to have been there with him and for him he's there on his own and it's his first thing and he just won one and you know we spent six years together working here and uh it was a, a large you know large part of your your life and and his career and it would have been really nice you know to share that with him more than anything but um i've got people saying to me can't you ask ben to have a look in the book i said no you know he's, he's up on stage getting his jacket <laughs> <laughs> it just made me think, why Why did, you know, if Michelin do know about how it affects people, you know, we could go back to, you know, Bernard Lussau or whatever, blowing his brains out because he thought he was going to lose a star and all of those kind of stories. Um, it does make you wonder, you know, they put, you know, especially with all that mental health stuff in the press and that at the time, and say, I know, I know a couple of people that were getting incredibly stressed and worried and stuff that because they'd been left out and it would appear that why didn't why didn't they invite the other two kent restaurants that year what just because i maybe i'd think oh i haven't got one then you know i don't i don't get what that was about they invited yeah. everybody else didn't exclude anybody else out in the country no other regions no. but no we'll uh, we'll give them a swerve because we're you know I, I don't know so if they are aware i think they need to be a little bit more aware because that was Quite, kind of quite damaging yeah um, it's quite cruel it's quite yeah, cruel well, when you I, when you say it like that so i think so but you know um they like with everything they do it's they like to be mysterious they they, you know, they don't have to tell anybody what they're doing and it's up to them yeah um, all i've done since is it made me realize that whereas i used to look at all their posts on instagram and maybe share them or that I now look at, you know, they're, they're still there. I see them and I just skip through them. It's like, it's, it is what it is. You know, they've, it's quite nice. They've been putting some recipes and stuff up from places through, like they do that now and through lockdown. Now it's quite nice because you see the odd nice dish and nice recipe in there. And, but all the other stuff, you know, when they started tweeting, I mean, you got the odd tweet. It was like, it was almost like your, your nan had got hold of your phone. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you know, some of the stuff they were putting up. <laughs> that might be one of those edit moments. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, obviously, no. this year um, is very different. And if anyone loses a start, I mean, it's it's never it's never going to feel like it's fair at any point anyway. Because as a chef, you know, like you said, it's awful to be judged on the thing that you do that that's your passion and that's what you do but for anyone to lose a star with everyone being closed and everything all over the place it would seem very unfair um so i don't know what your thoughts are on that because I, I don't they have said that they're they're back inspecting um so i don't know i are gonna be on this <laughs> um, i don't know whether i should be harsh or you know or sugarcoat this but when i first saw that they when things were being cancelled, like from from concerts to, you know, all kinds of things were being cancelled one after the other from March onwards, I couldn't help noticing that the Michelin roundhouse thing they were going to do that was in October hadn't been cancelled. And I was thinking, well, that's weird because all the gigs there have been cancelled. Everything It can't happen, yet they still hadn't cancelled. It was like it was left it and left it. And then till finally they announced that they're moving the date and stuff. 
and the good food guide had already said they weren't doing the guide this year and I think the AA or whatever and I just and I just thought oh, it's, it's a bit sad really because how the fuck can you put a guide out for inspecting restaurants when they've been shut for half the year some of them ain't open yet yeah it's this ridiculous and oh you know and I saw some quote about well it's not fair to um to you know people that have been waiting and you know worthy and it's not fair to not why ain't it well fucking covid ain't fair ain't fair on people that have died i mean really it, it's I, it's ridiculous it just to me it just makes it are you gonna get a copy of that guy and think oh great i'm gonna go there then because they've got they've got a star well for what for when everybody that's open there is not even opened as the same restaurant people mm. are doing different things different offers so Unless it's that up to date. So maybe, you know, like the AA now are awarding things, I think, you know, online and stuff. Because maybe, maybe that's current. Or maybe it's more current than a book. The book's never current anyways. It goes to bloody printing whenever. How many times does the book come out and, you know, a restaurant that's got a star saying, well, it's not even open anymore. Yeah. So I find it difficult. And, you know, unless, unless they are absolutely brilliant, I don't know how they can put a, a fair assessment guide and fair assessment of places out at the moment i think it's mad i think you've been better yeah off no i'm very intrigued by what they're going to do in january because yeah. i was i was expecting them to maybe put a, a pause on it or you know like everyone else has said not this year um but they seem pretty hell-bent on going ahead so we shall see but um what advice for anyone who does if they do lose a start now you've been through it what advice would you give to a chef who finds themselves in the same position as you, especially someone that's, you know, maintained it for such a long period of time. Turn your phone off. <laughs> <laughs> that was the best thing I've done. Um, and then you can, uh, then you can vet your uh, calls and your messages. And in your own time, you can phone people back and deal with it. And um, it is depressing. It does make you feel like, you know, well, business-wise for me, you know, I didn't doubt my abilities and stuff because I weren't cooking when we lost it. So it's as simple as that. I mean, I know, you know, I I remember the inspections. I remember, as, as I've already said, I was already, um, already knew that we were in a bit of trouble. Um, and that's my fault. You know, don't get me wrong. It's my fault. It's my restaurant. You know, you, you let things happen. You do what you do, don't you? You know, you make good decisions you make bad decisions in life things happen um the buck stops with me because it's my restaurant so i don't it's not like i'm shirking any responsibilities now everything you know whatever happens is, is down to me but um yeah i had no worries about the food side because when i got the star there was only me in the kitchen no one else not not even a pot wash so <laughs> i can quite honestly say you know, that was, you know, for whatever reason they deemed me worthy of it, it was me in the kitchen. And, um, and was, you know, outside, over that 16 year period, you know, I'd been here for six, for six years in and out and we, we worked really well together and they had other people through, you know, I've tried various things. I had the, you know, tried the head chef route a couple of times and all that to try and maybe, expand the business or do it. it gave me time to build the rooms and so i've done what i've had to do business wise and maybe that's it maybe it changes the offer a bit as well maybe you know because they have a they have a set criteria don't they on how they judge places none of us know what it is but they, say that we don't know what that criteria yeah. is but <laughs> don't actually know if they really do have one. but you know the way it would appear they would <laughs> you know they you know they say that they had i mean I'm sure that they don't, you know, they can't judge, they can't judge a pub in the country the same as they would judge, say, the Ritz. I mean, it would be ridiculous. So they might, you know, so there is a, there is a, a different marking or judging criteria. Um, so, you know, maybe in changing from little, you know, little husband and wife almost restaurant with no staff into having staff or a head chef and being a restaurant with rooms and that maybe maybe that's a another thing maybe the offer changes yeah i don't know um would have been nice for them to maybe give me some advice 
in that area as I was doing it or talk to it or tell me afterwards even, you know, reasons or, or whatever. But I say that's, that's quite often a contradiction of the guy, isn't it, is that they don't communicate with people. Um, but at the end of the day, I think, I think putting all of this importance on a fucking guidebook is ridiculous. You know, what relevance, you know, nowadays everybody, if you're in, if, if you're somewhere in the world now and you want uh, a great meal or you want a, a, a good coffee or a good sandwich, you're more likely to go on Instagram or Google or whatever your favorite search and stuff, canteen, yeah, you know, whatever your, your favorite uh, searches are. That's what you do. That's what most people do. I don't know many people that go, oh, I'll have a look on the, uh, the Michelin website because it's not the best to navigate, you know? Mm. Um, so, so do you think the Michelin guide then is, is more for chef kind of ego as opposed to consumer use? Well, it, it obviously does have good consumer use. Otherwise our business wouldn't have increased when we got it. And I know that's going back a few years, but I'm sure that's still the case. Mm -hmm. or, or would have been pre pre lockdown. Um, yeah. It must make a difference, but I think it makes a difference more because um, the likes of, well, the media, the likes of yourselves and, you know, and other lesser news outlets and, it's a news story and it's a thing. So it's PR. So, you know, having a star suddenly gives you press and PR where you could be unknown. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could be the little unknown restaurant, you know, that you've just opened in Bindon on your own. No one knows you're there. Suddenly you get a star. The BBC News are here. The local papers are here. You know, we're, we're talking about this now, all those years later. So it, it, has, it has a worth. It has a PR worth. And a so, yeah, like anything, and that's good for business. It increases awareness and, you know, as an actual guidebook, you know, it's got, it must, it's still got its avid followers because I know customers coming in here saying, I will never buy a Michelin guide. I've bought every copy of the Michelin guide since 1927 or whatever, you know, old people. Um, <laughs> and uh, just saying, you know, dis disgusted, you know, um, that you're not in it now. I'll never buy, I've written to them, I'll never buy another copy again. I think, Great, funny, but <laughs> though there are people that obviously swear by the guide. There's yeah. others that, you know, don't give it a lot of credence at all, aren't they? You know, I know quite a few journalists and that that don't. Yeah. Um, I think it's a nice thing to, it's always nice to have accolades. It's always nice to have something to celebrate what you, what you do, um, especially as an industry, because you all work really hard. And especially through, through this, I mean, although they're not, in my eyes, I don't. I'm the same as you. I'm not really sure how they can, how they can do it through this. But even at the end of this, it's still, it's still nice to say, well done, isn't it? So yeah, it is, and it's great for the, it's great for the boys in the kitchen and and the and the front of house and everyone because it gives them that sense of achievement. You know, it's like it's a pat on the back because you don't get too many of those, do you, from cutting? You know, you you get complaints, you get you know, you get arseholes. You have they deal with all of that stuff, but it's not that often that people actually, you know, give you a pat on the back or, or a so-called award for doing something, whatever that yeah. award, you know, like the much, I think the most, the much coveted golden staff canteen mug, I think has to be the, the, <laughs> the pinnacle. <laughs> you know that you've made it in life when you've got one of those. I, I think, you now. <laughs> well, I'll let you know if I ever get one. And it's only food. You know that we're only cooking a bit of grub. <laughs> we're cooking a bit of dinner. Get real. <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> well, thank you so much for talking to me um, about it and being so honest about it. Um, and, you know, like you said, it's a, it's a funny year this year, so I don't think anyone should really take too much no, from the guides this year. And, uh, and I will definitely, if I don't speak to you before, I'll be speaking to you in January if that event goes ahead and we'll have a little chat about what they decide to do. So. Okay. <laughs> brilliant all right well thank you very much graham and i'll speak to you soon thanks a lot see you later all right thanks bye we hope you enjoyed this interview and if you have 
any comments, feel free to tweet us or comment on the post. Uh, we're making all of our interviews available to download. And if you want to support us to continue creating great content with amazing people from the hospitality industry, please take a look at our contribution scheme on www.thestaffcanteen.com. This episode of Grilled is sponsored by Rationale, your leading provider in multifunctional hot food preparation equipment. Register now for a free Rationale live demo at www.rationale-online.com.